Join us now on Flickr at flickr.com slash groups slash art of photography. everybody, my name is Ted Forbes and welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. We are going to start covering a lot of black and white film techniques. Uh, we did an overview episode uh, last time around. And today I want to share with you some tools that are used with black and white photography that you're going you're gonna to probably need at some point. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is a light meter. Now I've showed this meter before and we've talked about this in a much earlier episode from a couple years ago. Uh, but I kind of wanted to hit a review on this again because uh, you know there also has been some discussion on the Flickr group lately about light meters and, and some of these new new iPhone apps that you can get. And while those are fine, they're, they're good in a pinch, um, they're really, and I think most of you know, they're really not going to replace an actual real light meter. And I know there's a vast price difference between a 99 cent iPhone app and something that costs a couple hundred bucks. But the good news is about light meters is they're not like camera bodies where a new one comes out every year making another one obsolete. So you're probably only going to have to do it once. And it is so invaluable to me. I mean, this is probably one of the most uh, important pieces of photography equipment that I own other than a camera. Um, and a couple features that this one does and, and the, the, the cost on these will vary depending on what kind of features you're talking about. So, um, you know, first of all, this one reads, uh, does incandescent reading, so it reads reflective light. It has this little dome that pops up. And what I can do <clears throat> is if you're shooting a portrait, let's say you're shooting a portrait of me right here, what you would do is you would, you would click the meter button to just hold it up next to my face. And basically the 3D dome will account for a shadow or something like that. And what light meters do, if you're only familiar with using what's in your camera, it's typically they take multiple light readings in a scene of uh, like for instance the white wall behind me is a lot brighter than like my shirt or my hair or even this light meter and so those read at different EV settings and what uh, a light meter will do is take an average of all the uh, all the possible uh, EVs that it sees in a scene it will average those together and you know different depending on how advanced the meter is different meters work differently but they basically have different methods of averaging all those into what it thinks is the the, the best reading for that scene um, on an average and then calculate the exposure on that. And so this will do the same thing. Uh, that wouldn't be a reason to use it other than your, your in-camera meter necessarily. Um, but anyway, that's one thing that this does. The other thing it does is I can hook this one up to a flash or up to strobes and it will take a flash reading. So when I, you know, I click the button to take the reading, it fires the strobes and it will take a reading on that. Uh, that's an advanced feature and that usually drives the price up uh, considerably in a meter. But at the very minimum of what we're going to be doing with a lot of this black and white stuff is you want something that will do what is called spot metering. And and basically this has a little lens on it and when I look through the viewfinder um, I see the scene much like I would through a camera and there's a, a dark circle in the middle and it takes a reading of whatever's inside that circle so it allows me to focus in I can just take a reading off of my shirt for instance or just take a reading off of that white wall and what this enables you to do and we're going to get into that later uh, but a lot of times your camera uh, doesn't matter whether it's film or whether it's digital it only picks up a certain range of light and you know light is measured in stops and so cameras typically like like a film has the capability usually around five usable zones of light or stops of light. Uh, sometimes you can extend it beyond that. We're going to talk about how to do that. And same with digital. A uh, digital camera is probably a little less than film, although a lot of the sensors now are starting to get advanced enough to where they're, they're actually reading more light. But there are situations where you're in a real high contrast situation, something like that, and you want to be able to actually capture more light than your camera's going to be able to pick up. And that's where having a spot meter to be able to tell how many stops of light those two zones are apart. And again, this is starting to sound like zones system, which it is, and we're going to get into that in the next episode. But anyway, having a, a, uh, a light meter that will do spot reading, even if you, you have a light meter that only does spot reading um, and no other features, then that's, that's a very handy tool to have. And uh, like I said, I went ahead and had some more features in here, so I have a little more versatility with it. But uh, again, this is a Siconic. Um, you don't have to get this specific model. There's a ton of models out there. I will put a link to it in the show notes if you're curious. But uh, this has never failed me, and I think this is really one of the most important pieces of photography equipment I've ever purchased other than having a camera. Uh, it really is that important. So anyway, that is uh, the light meter and uh, we're going to look at some other things here. Okay, so let's talk about books for a second and this is going to apply mainly to the people in the film crowd who are watching. Uh, They're going to be shooting on film. A lot of these techniques uh, or a lot of these books were written um, uh, not too recently with the exception of one of them and so they're going to be dealing pre-digital. But if you are a 
digital photographer, I still recommend checking these out because I think they're going to give you a better understanding of exposure and kind of some of the history behind it, uh, things like that. You can get all these at used bookstores or online, extremely cheap. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is Ansel Adams' The Negative. And The Negative was part of the three book series that Ansel is kind of known for. Uh, the first book in the series being The Camera, uh, the second one being The Negative, and the third one being The Print. And these three books kind of covered the entire process of photography um, as he saw it and a lot of his techniques, a lot of his personal opinions on things like cameras, uh, whatnot. They're all three really good, uh, but we're going to be specifically talking about Zone System, which is what The Negative is all about. Um, the Negative, I will warn you, it is the historical um, kind of monument uh, about Zone System. So if you are going to get into Zone System, I really recommend that you get a copy of it. I bought mine at a used bookstore for 10 bucks, so, uh, and I've seen it cheaper if you get it in paperback, something like that. So The Negative is extremely good to have. Um, if you can't find The Negative for whatever reason, um, there are a bunch of books, and this is just one that I happen to have. This is John P. Schaefer's Basic Techniques of Photography and Ansel Adams Guide. And more or less, John, <clears throat> and he wasn't the only one who did this, Ansel taught and he had a lot of students that wrote books uh, after they had stayed with Ansel, which basically regurgitate the same information that's in the camera, the print, and the negative, uh, all in one book on this one. But it does give a good overview of the zone system. Uh, it gets into enough detail and in some ways I think, and the reason I'm showing this to you is it may be a little better than the negative in the sense that um, the negative gets pretty bogged down in details. Um, it gets into uh, all kinds of things that probably aren't going to be as relevant today. So again, it's it's kind of the the the, um, the ultimate reference guide, but sometimes having a secondary book on something like that of one of Ansel's students is, is a good idea as well. I'll give you the same information in maybe a more clear fashion. And then finally, this is one of my favorite books of all time for techniques of black and white photography. This is John Blakemore's Black and White Photography Workshop. And John Blakemore is an extremely good photographer. He's a British photographer. He does He's known as a teacher. And uh, this book is simply sublime in the way that it takes the zone system and applies it to more than just getting a really uh, even toned photograph. So a lot of what Ansel was going for, and if you look at Ansel's work, it, it speaks like this. Uh, but what he's doing is about capturing light into a really uh, beautiful, uh, complete spectrum and being able to replicate that easily in the darkroom on a print. And that was kind of all that was what he was about. Uh, what John Blakemore does is he takes that a step or two further and he starts showing you applying those same techniques, some of the special effects you can get out of them. So for instance, if you want to change the mood of a photograph, uh, let's say you're shooting in the fog, uh, there aren't a lot of dark shadows when you're shooting in fog. And so um, he shows you how to get some techniques out of some film where you're able to, uh, you know, really capture that feel of, of mist, fog, and, and a ton of other things. High key, low key photography, uh, really dark stuff, really bright stuff, and everything in between. So anyway, uh, between these three books, um, those are the ones I really recommend. I'm going to be going over a lot of these techniques, so you know, you can just watch the podcast if you want. But if you really want to dig deeper and go into this, this is kind of the three things I learned the most from. And uh, again, that's uh, Ansel Adams' The Negative, uh, the Ansel Adams Guide, Basic Techniques of uh, Photography, and the John Blakemore Black and White Photography Workshop, which are all three excellent. Now, I also want to talk about film. Okay, so this is one thing I realized I haven't covered in this podcast yet, is black and white films. And there's a lot of difference between films. There are also some really good books out there that have some examples in them, so you can see kind of uh, the, the different looks you get from different films. And it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here to get into tonal curves and things like that. But um, I do want to talk, just to give you an overview of what's available and what you can get. Uh, by far, probably one of the most famous black and white films is, is Kodak Tri-X, or TXP. It comes in two flavors these days. There's a professional version, which is a 320. ISO, and there's also a 400 ISO reading that you can get as well. And uh, Tri-X is a really good place to start if you have no experience with film whatsoever and you're just going to start out and try it. Uh, I would go for Tri-X. It's a 400 speed, so it's what's known as a high speed film, even though digital cameras are showing us now that ISO 400 is, is not nearly as high as they can go. Um, but anyway, compared to historical, um, you know, kind of benchmarks in film, 400 was pretty high when Tri-X was developed. Uh, they've changed the recipe of this over the years. and. Uh, more or less, you know, there are some technical differences, but it's still a really good middle of the road versatile film to use. Um, essentially, when you get into black and white film, and this is what's interesting to me is, you know, you hear people saying that film is dead and that, you know, you're going to have trouble getting it, the death of Kodachrome. Well, the truth is, is that people haven't used a lot of Kodachrome in a long time, and that's a color film. Uh, what's interesting is with black and white film, if you look online, there are more choices and more available uh, film types than we've ever had these days. And I think it's really exciting in terms of black and white film. Film. And there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers who who prefer to develop themselves in the darkroom. And you know, I went through a period where I kind of 
just, I was into trying every film type I could possibly could, which actually is probably not a good idea. You want to stick with something and learn it. Um, but, you know, people are going to do stuff like that because it is exciting. Uh, but anyway, Trix is a good way to go. Um, the two major film manufacturers uh, would be, um, for black and white film, would be Kodak and then another company from England called Ilford. And both of them make exceptional product. Um, they, they basically film will come in basically two and a half flavors. And I'll explain what that half is in a second, but let's say two flavors of film right now. There's traditional film, uh, traditional black and white grain structure, things like that. And then there's what they're calling uh, tea grain. And tea grain are, is a more modern uh, grain type. Uh, it uses a different technique to make the emulsion on the film. And it's much cleaner. And some people don't prefer that. Some people prefer the older uh, kind of gritty grain. And then there's other people who prefer a, uh, a almost non-existent at times, but smoother film grain. And so, it, you know, with the old school um, style of film, Kodak makes like in a slow speed, you can get uh, um, uh, plus X, is, which is, uh, reads at 125 ISO. It's a beautiful film, one of my favorites. Uh, there's Tri-X, which is an excellent middle of the road film. And I think up until recently, they may have stopped making it, but they have a, uh, actually there's a 3200 speed. So I'll get in that in a minute. The T-grain films are the T-Max series that they've got. And so basically you've got T-Max 100 or T-MX, and then you have T-MY, which is T-Max 400. And so there's a slow and a faster uh, speed in both those. And there's a 3200, and I think that may be the one that they stopped making recently. Uh, you can push or pull these films. We'll talk about that later. Again, it gets out of the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, Ilford has uh, a very comparable range. Uh, they have added a very uh, an even slower film. They have uh, Pan F, which reads at an ISO of 50, which is a really low grain, old school type emulsion. And then you have um, then you have uh, 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 Ilford Pan F, which is a 125. It's real similar to uh, to the Plus X and Kodak. And then they have HP5, which is their 400. Uh, and then Ilford also has their T grain series too, which is going to be the Ilford Delta series. So there's Delta 100, there's Delta 400, which is one of my favorites. Again, I use a lot of Delta 400. I just it's personal preference. I love it. Uh, and then there's also a 3200 that you can get for medium format. Um, and then I said there's two and a half because there's kind of another category that 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 people are still making, which are specialty films, uh, which really Really, are, the point of them is to try to recapture uh, some of the vibe and some of the the techniques that were used back in like the early days of of, um, of sheet film. So you're looking at uh, you know slower speeds, higher grain. Uh, they don't put hardeners in the developer emulsion, so you kind of have to use traditional fixers with them. Uh, and those include things like uh, there's a company called Adox, um, and then there's uh, this is a 100 speed. They have a 25 speed, and there's another company called Efka, and here's a roll of Efka 25. So this is really slow film, uh, probably not good for street photography, you're going to be doing more landscapes, things like that with it, uh, or using really hot flash bulbs, um, one of the two, because it's so slow. Um, Fuji uh, is another player, and Fuji is kind of discontinuing some of their stuff, but they still make one of my favorite films for night photography, which is this Fuji Acros. It's a 100 speed film, uh, and it rates really well for night photography because it deals with long exposures really well, and we'll talk about that when we get into night photography. Um, there's also, if you kind of want to go on the cheaper side of things, you can find uh, online, if you go to Freestyle Photo or b &H or one of those, uh, you can find films such as um uh, there's a company called Arista.edu, which makes a student quality film. So they're a lot cheaper. They're kind of an older school style emulsion, things like that. Uh, if you've never shot film before, once again, I would probably start with something like Triax or Ilford HP5. They're very comparable, made by two different companies, but it's the same kind of thing. Anyway, I know this has been a lot of information today, so kind of take it slow. Check out the show notes. If you go to thepublicbroadcast.com, uh, you can see uh, I'll put some links to things online so you can kind of review. But I just kind of wanted to give you a mass overview of, of uh, tools used in black and white photography and a lot of the things that, that, um, that we're going to be talking about in upcoming episodes. So anyway, next time we're going to get into the zone system. So it's going to be pretty interesting if you've uh, never really explored that. I think you're really going to like it. And, uh, but anyway, I think that's enough information for today. Um, don't want people's heads to spin too much, So especially if you're not familiar with film. So anyway, once again, this has been The Art of Photography, and thank you for watching.